Hi, it's Joy Griggs with Estate and Wisdom. Today we'll discuss 10 things a retiree should never disclose. When it comes to this list, you're gonna think some things where you're gonna be like, yeah, I know not to disclose that. Things like their social security number, or at least you should be very cautious about disclosing that. But I'm gonna go over some of these things in the list where you're gonna be like, yeah, this is a pretty good idea. I will say first and foremost that whether you're a retiree and you're elderly, whether you're young and starting off, that these 10 things are important and things that we should all be cautious about sharing because the information that we share is information that can and sometimes is used against us. So the first place I'm gonna start with is the National Council on Aging. They share the top five financial crimes targeting older people. And what they said is in 2022, there were 88,262 complaints of fraud resulting in $3.1 billion in losses from people 60 and older. And then when you go into the numbers, it says about 65% of them fall within these five categories. And the number one is government impersonation scams. And that is when someone calls you up pretending to be a government employee, probably most commonly going to be the IRS. And what they'll do is they will use some sort of a scare tactic. Well, they'll say, you need to give us certain information or you're going to be mailed this complaint, or we need to verify your information to make sure that you get your tax return. There's something that they're going to tell you. And then when they get your information, they're able to then take advantage and open accounts and cars and different things in your name. Sometimes they're actually able to completely steal your tax return. Number two is sweepstakes and lottery scams. And all that is, is just in the sound of someone calls you up and they pretend to be Publisher Clearinghouse or something like that, where they'll say, hey, you know, this is Dre from Publisher Clearinghouse. You won. All we need is the processing fee, the registration fee, some sort of a fee. And then once you give them the money, you don't actually get the return that they promised you. There, there is no prize. You could be calling for months or weeks. And sometimes they even call back multiple times and try to take advantage of you. The third one is robocalls and phone scams. What they'll do is they'll call you and they'll say something like, can you hear me? And if you say yes, they'll then click and hang up on you. And then they'll use that voice activated yes when they call in and try to open a bunch of different accounts. And they'll say, hey, are you okay with this? You know, you, you called those numbers before. And it's completely automated. It'll say, do you authorize this? And then they'll play the recording of you saying yes. Uh, and then that's really like a crazy thing, but that's definitely the third most common one. And so you want to be careful when you're dealing with that. Number four is computer tech support scams. And maybe what, what happens is your computer may have something that pops up and it's like, hey, your computer is compromised. You need to call this 1-800 number. And then you call the number and it gets rerouted to somewhere else. And they'll ultimately say, well, let me log into your computer. And you'll say, okay, sure. Well, when they log into your computer, what they do is they take all the passwords, all the information, they log all the logins to your account, and they're able to take all of your money out. There's one that they mentioned here in 2021 that says a man from Illinois lost his life savings from scammers pretending to be an employee of a known antivirus company. What they did is they said they were going to give the man a refund for unused software. And what happened is these con artists were able to gain access to his bank accounts and his home equity line of credit. They were able to ultimately take $200,000 out of his retirement fund, which is obviously really tough. And the fifth one is the grandparent scam. And this one is kind of crazy, but what they're doing is they'll play on or your love for your child. And so they'll say the child is, is kidnapped or in a tough spot or needs a surgery or something like that, where this person's gonna call you and pretend to be a doctor or a lawyer or a police officer. And they're gonna say, hey, we need the money to be able to help them. And it's a very unique situation. So we need you to be kind of hush hush about it because we're trying to figure everything out. And ultimately the great parent is gonna give the money. Now, sometimes there's reports where they actually come to your door, where the courier will come to your door and get the money and then they'll leave and disappear. And so what you can see is there's a variety of ways that we can be scammed. And when it comes to the 10 things you should be very cautious about disclosing and giving over the phone and to strangers in different situations to make sure that you don't get caught up in one of these, the number one is naturally gonna be your financial details. You wanna be cautious about really any specific numbers, especially exact amounts in your retirement savings and investments, even your pension income. When people are able to use this information, sometimes these are security questions where it's like, hey, how much is exactly in the account? And if they're able to tell the bank how much is in the account, then they're going to say, okay, well, they have all the information, so that it must be okay. And then they could drain the account, like the example that we just gave. Number two is your social security number, your personal identification numbers, any PIN numbers and passwords. All of these are ways that we try to safeguard you and your money. And if you give this information away, it makes it harder for someone to be denied access to certain accounts where they have all of that personal information. Anytime you have travel plans, you don't want to just tell people where you're going. I remember reading the story about Kim Kardashian and how she used to actively post where she was at on her social media handles 
And she ultimately was in London and they had kidnapped her and stole all of her jewelry and things like that. But it was because she gave that information on social media that they're able to follow and keep up with her. And then they knew exactly where she was going to be. And then they're able to put plans in place to be able to rob her. And so now she posts, I think, on a week or two weeks late basis or some, something like that to where she no longer posts actively where she's at. If you're going to post where you're traveling and all your experiences, post it after the fact. That way you're already back, already at home and everything's okay. Any health issues that you have, you normally want to keep those private. These are things that are very specific to you and you don't want them to be used against you. Any home security information where, where you're showing where the safe is at and the vaults and the different stuff that's in your house. Again, reality stars are the ones that we can learn a lot of this from. And I remember that there was someone else, who was it? I think it was someone in one of the Beverly Hills housewives or something. And they, they robbed them or they, they were showing this lavish life that they had. And they, they had a ton of videos and as a result, they ultimately were robbed and the people knew where all of their stuff was go figure because they showed where the safe was and all of the different things. And ultimately, I think they were able to use the fact that they knew the husband traveled a lot and that the, the wife was there with the kids and they got her to open and access everything. And fortunately, they did not kill the world, but they could have immediately after she opened everything up. So you don't want to let people know that you have these safety measures in place, even though it may seem like you're protecting yourself or it's like, hey, this is not something you can access. They can't access it with a gun to your head. And so we do want to be very cautious about the information that we're giving out, especially as we get older and more retired. Number six on our list is family conflicts and inheritance details. It is something that I'm shocked by how often families will, will fight over stuff, and, but it is a real thing. And as best as you can, if you either are able to meet that early on where everybody knows what they get and you feel fairly good that you divided it evenly. But I remember just seeing just this past Christmas and I was, I was down at Palm Beach visiting my family. There's a story of this brother who, who shot his sister over Christmas presents. Now I didn't click in the article. I rarely read that type of information. I just see the headlines, but I was, man, could you, could you imagine whatever rage you felt in the moment once it subsided that the, the idea that you, that you shot a sibling over, over stuff, over presents, but it does show that it is something that I think you should be cautious of as a retiree disclosing especially if you receive the inheritance and your sibling, you don't know what they receive. Now, if it's one of those where everybody's fairly confident, we had discussions, we know it was split relatively evenly. Well, that's fine. But if you're not a hundred percent sure that it was split evenly, or your parents were trying to figure something out and it may not be as well received as, as everyone thought it was, I would be very cautious as a retiree about disclosing, you know, how much or what type of inheritance that I received. Whatever reason that your parents or family members give it to you is the reason that they gave it to you. And it's just something that you do want to be cautious of that everybody roots for us as long as we're below them. But once we're about to pass them, you find that it switches up a little bit. And so uh, I do think that's something that's probably a really good idea. Number seven on our list is passwords and pens. We don't want to share them and we definitely want to update them. And I know I'm someone who doesn't update his passwords as regularly as I should, but I do update them. And if you've ever worked at a company where they update the password every few months, it's not because they want to, it's not because they're being jerks about it. It's because we know that that ultimately protects the company and the information inside of the company, that it's bad business practice to allow your employees to maintain the exact same password for years and years and years. So then why will we in our personal life not want to update our passwords? Even if you do it the way that you did when you're an employee, or at least the way I did, where I just updated the last number. So it was like number one. And then it was number two. And then it was like number 30. I just updated it every three or four months. However often they have me update my password. And I just updated the number on the end, but it is still valuable. It's a better layer of protection than just having the same password and all of your accounts. So if they're able to hack a less than stellar company where there's, there's different levels. I think we would all agree to that, that if I have an account on a fast food website, it's different than the account on my banking website, that there's different levels of security. Well, if they hack into the fast food website and get the same password that they can now use on the banking website, well, well, now we've just kind of messed up our own protection. And so we do want to update our password periodically. And ideally you don't want to have the same password everywhere. I know it makes things a little bit more complicated and a little bit more work for us on our end, but it does make it a lot more harder for the people who are trying to steal our money and our information and trying to, you know, steal our identity, even in many instances. Number eight on our list is your social security check arrival dates. If you let people know the day your check comes in, there's a small chance that someone may start taking it out your mailbox. And so we don't want to let people know the dates that our checks are coming in. 
And we don't want to give any of that type of information out. We don't want to let people know what our overall patterns of living are. And that leads us into number nine, which is the routine in our overall schedule. We don't want to take the exact same path and eat at the exact same restaurants and sit at the exact same table, because as you create this pattern of consistency, then yeah, sure. They may know what I want to order when I, when I show up at the restaurant. Sure. I may get the same table and, and I may have a great pattern of life, but at the same time, we also open ourselves up to being followed and tailed and possibly being taken advantage of if people are able to figure out where we spend our time or maybe they met us somewhere like, wow, this person seems very successful. And then as they found the pattern, they're able to take advantage of us. And while it shouldn't be that way, I think we all agree that it can and is that way in many ways. So having a variety of ways that you go to work and the restaurants you go to is just a layer of protection where you don't want to give that type of information away either. And the last on our list is your overall relationship status, living alone, things like that. You don't want to share this information that can be used against you. There are stories about people who will talk about traveling and then a squatter comes in their house. There are stories where people talk about living alone and then they get robbed. There is so much that's going on where we'll say, oh, I have this lost family member. And then someone calls and pretends to be this family member. Or we have arguments with someone and we share that information. And then someone uses that information against us. There is a lot that people use with our information that we don't think about often. But when we do take a step back and you think about those scams, all of this information can be used on those five scams that are often the ones that have generated over $3 billion in losses of people's money being stolen from them. But by being cautious about what you disclose, then you're able to protect yourself, not only your heart and your peace of mind, but also your money and your future and your family and your children. I just want to thank you always for the time that we spend together. If you find value in this video, go ahead and like and subscribe so you can continue receiving valuable insights on how to create a wealthy retirement plan so that you can live more and worry less. Until next time, stay safe and enjoy life.